Welcome to Selling in the Motor Trade, in association with Automotive Management and Simcoe Training. This is the weekly podcast where we share best practice, tips, and ideas on how to sell more cars, improve your service department, and generally put more profit into your dealership or dealer group. I'm your host, Simon Bokert, or some of you might already know me as Skippy. And firstly, I want to say thank you for taking the time to tune in. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Selling in the Motor Trade. Today, I'm very, very honored to be with James Fortman. Now, James is the CEO of the Australian Automotive Dealers Association. And you might think, well, what's that got to do with us in Europe? Well, you may have heard about the sales agency model. On this podcast, lots of clients have been talking about it. Lots of people have been talking about the impact it's going to have on their business. If you're an investor, if you make your livelihood out of the motor trade, you really need to listen to what James has got to say about agency model. I would say that James is probably at the epicenter of what's happening in the Australian market. Uh, currently, as we speak, there is a court case going on where something like 80% of the Mercedes dealers are taking their manufacturer to court. Have you ever heard of 80% of the whole uh, the dealers within a manufacturer being so upset they're actually taking the manufacturer to court? So we need to, uh, um, uh, we've got lots of questions for James. Uh, we need to find out as much as we can about agency and what impact it can have on the business. So James, Percy, welcome aboard and thank you very much for your time. No problem. Thanks for having me, Simon. Now, to start off with, we'd like to get to know our guests a little bit. So we have a few questions. We ask the same people all the time, same questions. Um, Tell me, how did you get started in the motor trade? Well, look, that's a really interesting question. And I I suppose I'm not, um, you know, typical of your uh, automotive trade guests. I I work on, on policy and regulatory issues. Um, So where I started from long ago was studying politics at at uni and I started working for industry bodies and it was while I was in uh, the property industry working uh, and doing policy for for property developers that I got uh, offered a job with uh, the equivalent of the the, the AA in in the UK, the the RAC or the AA. Um, So the group representing motorists and over here it's called the Australian Automobile Association and I worked there for three years on a number of interesting uh, issues, um, where after that period of time, I worked in a minister's office, a minister um, in the Commonwealth government who was responsible for things like vehicle emissions policy, things like uh, road charging policy um, and vehicle standards policy. And it was there um, that I dealt with uh, the the dealers in Australia. We had some policy issues that we worked closely together on. Uh, and after a few years, I was I was offered a job to work for the Australian Automotive Dealer Association, um, and that was about five years ago. And uh, you know, I've been working for them ever since on really interesting issues like franchising policy, taxation policy, um, emissions, as I mentioned earlier, and a range of other things. Perfect. Well, that this podcast, it's got a bigger following in Europe and uh, USA than Australia currently, uh, although it's growing all the time in Australia. So some of the listeners, they might be thinking, uh, you know, what does an Aussie or am I right in thinking South African listen to the accent there? Um, yeah. What do they know about our market? Um, so I suppose I, I understand you worked in the UK for a short period of time as well. Is that right? Yeah, look, I did. I, what a lot of South Africans and Aussies do is they, they take a gap year in the UK and they work, uh, you know, sort of uh, low skill type of jobs and earn enough money so they can travel throughout Europe and drink beer and, uh, and see, see all of the, the beautiful countries in Europe. Um, so I, I did. I worked as a furniture removalist in, in the UK for a year, spent a bit of time living in, in Manchester and a bit of time in London. So got to know the country pretty well. Wasn't as involved in the motor industry at that stage, uh, but through my time at the AADA, uh, I have worked closely with uh, people like Sue Robinson at the NFDA. And we always do like to look at the UK as a market because it's like Australia. It's one of those only right-hand drive markets yes. in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a number of manufacturers with British, uh, you know, British manufacturers such as Jaguar Land Rover, uh, uh, the likes of, of Mini, Uh, and others. So, uh, look, it is something I keep an eye on. The markets are definitely different. Um, And if you just look at the top 10 selling cars in each market, you'll see how they are different. The Australian market, 
our top two selling cars are both uh, Utes, uh, Toyota Hilux, Ford Rangers. Um, in the UK, I'm not sure, but I'm guessing you're, you're probably looking at a smaller type of car. What is it, Simon? Hey, you caught me off track there. I don't know the top <laughs> selling car at the moment there, but uh, I, I know Tesla 3 did very well because they could yeah. get them at the moment. Um, we, uh, we're still struggling to get supply of vehicles there at the moment. But um, I just yeah. got to say, uh, the Ute, okay, of course, a pickup, we would call it. Um, yeah. And it's quite funny, as an Australian and a South African, I, I did the same thing as you. When I was 17, I, I left the motor trade, and I think it was 95, a good friend and I, we went backpacking. We had to. We have, we have no culture back home in Australia, so we have to come to Europe to go and find some. <laughs> And uh, but I got stuck here. Um, I, I married my wife. I got stuck here. So um, it's um, yeah. This is where I am now. Um, so so moving on. This question here is a shameless plug for our sales fitness program. Uh, we have a first ninety day program where James we say that uh, the skills that we learn in the first ninety days, good and bad, last us for the rest of our career. Can I ask you in your first three months? Um, there's, is there anything that you learned that is relevant today as it was relevant when you first started? Yeah, look, the, I think the most important thing uh, in your first sort of 90 days in any new industry is um, listening and learning from those people uh, that you know have been successful in the industry. Um, I probably uh, was very fortunate to have uh, worked with a couple of industry legends when I got to the ADA. One of them was a guy called David Blackhall, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, in Australia had worked for decades for various OEMs, including Ford. Uh, he worked as a dealer and he also worked for, uh, uh, he actually led uh, the, the Asia Pacific Jaguar Land Rover operation. And, wow, um, to have both sides know, of it. That's rare, isn't did. it? Yeah. He did. And um, he, he had the experience on both sides, but he also had amazing communication skills. Um, and um, I just uh, sort of tried to absorb as, as much as I possibly could from him. I learned uh, about both sides of the relationship. And, and, you know, I probably learned more from him than I've learned from anyone in the industry. And I've used that and grown that knowledge base. But the foundation uh, was identifying the right person. I also had a fantastic chair at the time, uh, uh, sort of a generational dealer called Terry Keating. And he was also very generous with his time with me. So I think where you can latch on to the, uh, the people that, that will afford you that opportunity to learn um, and, and just make yourself available to them. Well, in your time as the um, CEO of the Australian Automotive Dealers Association, you must have seen some really, really good dealerships. Um, you must go in some places and see some people that really punch above their weight. Can I ask you, what separates the good from the great or the great from the good, I should say? Is there anything that stands out that you, you see a trend all the time, the great dealers are doing things? Yeah, you know, I think it's, uh, it's putting the customer first. Um, you know, we're seeing that at the moment uh, in, in a supply constrained environment. It's actually a really good time to be a dealer um, and you can get away with, with poor customer service because you know, in a situation where uh, demand exceeds supply, you're not fighting for the customers in the way yeah. you used to. But it's those dealers, I think, that that put their customers first um, and um, create a, an environment in which they encourage their staff to always be customer focused, to always value the longer term, uh, you know, relationship rather than the quick sale. Um, you know, goes the extra miles with things like providing uh, service loan vehicles, uh, you know, getting uh, explanations uh, to customers about how technology works, taking, you know, going to those extra bits of trouble just to ensure that the customer is first um, and um, is, is going to come back to you when they, when they have an opportunity, whether it's for service, whether it's to buy a new car, whether it's to uh, to refinance, uh, you know, making that impression on the customer at every opportunity you can um, and, and leaving the customer the positive uh, experience. I, I think uh, the, the dealers that strive for that, I think, are the ones that are going to be uh, successful. James, and it's right now, you, you've hit the nail on the head for me. It's been so easy over the last couple of years because we've got limited supply and you, you didn't have to be a genius to sell a car, new or used. 
consequently, we do see lots of customer service go out the window, but it's going to come and bite that dealer on the bum. Sure, they're making a fortune at the moment, but now's the time to get the processes right. And I, we're seeing low-hanging fruit, I would say, is happening out there. No, 100% right. I think not valuing the long-term relationship with the customer um, is the biggest mistake, and it's the trap people can easily fall into in a time like this. This is the golden age of being a dealer. And that's great, but it's only gonna last for two, maybe another yep. two years or so. And after that, it's gonna be a very competitive environment again. And, and you know, myself, I've been a customer and, and I know um, that I would go back to, to those dealers who looked yeah. after me. So you think another two years of limited supply from the OEMs, is that your gut feel at the moment? Um... Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, we we actually were in a dealer meeting the other day and we we did a live sort of on the spot poll in terms mm -hmm. of how long do you think uh, supply lasts? And uh, I think I think it was a minimum of 12 months, but likely okay. two years of what all of the dealers were saying. The reality is, Simon, we don't know how various OEMs are going to react. We've heard statements from some of them um, at a global level saying we will never go back to a, a massive uh, oversupply situation. We got ourselves mm. into that, and we won't let that happen again. And maybe that is maybe that is the reality that everyone looks at this current environment and learns the lessons. Uh, yeah. But as you know, it only takes one. Exactly. And what we have in Australia, which you probably don't have to the extent in the UK, is we've got so many brands, and we've got so many brands from China now looking to yeah. come into our market. And with all that competition, the temptation to uh, to sort of up the volume game will be there. So, um, look, let's see how it goes. But I think in the in the medium term, uh, you know, the, the semiconductor crisis is is going to uh, is going to restrict supply for a couple more years. Yeah, I, I just concerned that uh, the manufacturers have very short memories, and my concern is, as you said, it only takes one. We need market yep. share. Let's go and beat Ford. Let's go and beat Toyota. Uh, I remember. Um, I was working for Mike Carney Toyota and one of the latest Land Cruisers was launched. And, you know, we all got together and said, hey, guys, we need to make good money out of this. Let's not discount it. You know, it wasn't long before the dealer and Air or Ingham or whatever was cutting the guts out of it. It, it just happened so quickly. And that's my concern. Yeah. Let's, let's hope it continues as long as we can. And to give you a quick example, in Australia, over the last two years, we've seen a little British brand called MG, which yes. is now, of course, a Chinese brand. Yep. Um, rise from being a tiny, small market share to a top 10 brand in Australia. Wow, so it's MG had, top 10. Wow. MG is top 10 in Australia. Um, wow. And it's, it's, you know, it's had this uh, really uh, quick ascent into the top 10. EVs and help them a lot with that, I would imagine. E yeah, the EV product is, but, you know, they're also, uh, you know, I think whether the supply uh, issues better yep. than other brands. Okay. Um, and, you know, they're pricing their cars um, very well. So, and and I don't think they're suffering from the problem that, uh, you know, the Great Walls and the Cherries of this world suffered from because people don't really know that they're necessarily Chinese. They've still got mm -hmm. that association with a British brand. But yep. my point is when you've got a brand like that, suddenly getting into the top 10, um, all the other established OEMs are looking at that and saying, oh, crap, well, we better, we better yeah. try and compete. Let's yeah. get more uh, incentive offers in there. So, so it's it's in a it's in a market like that where it's going to be difficult for OEMs to hold their discipline on the on the the, the volume front. Yeah, it, it's something. Um, speaking to uh, at the NADA conference, I'll meet with a lot of Australian dealers and people listening to this podcast in Europe might be amazed where Mazda has something like eight or nine percent market share out there. It, it is a different market. Like Mazda, I think is a less than one percent market share in the UK currently. Um, so there, there clearly are differences out there. But MG top ten, that's really amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, listen, we first met at the, um, the Australian Automotive Dealers Association, the conference, I, I believe it was uh, Melbourne or the Gold Coast. I think it was Melbourne. Melbourne. It was Melbourne. Melbourne. Good memory, sir. Uh, and yeah. by the way, your conference, you punch above your weight. OK, that conference is I, I've been to lots of conferences around the world, as you would imagine, uh, speaking at uh, various conferences. But you guys for a relatively small market, do such a good job. The guest speakers you get in there is sensational. The way you do it for your dealers is really, really good, okay? But can I yeah. ask you, um, mm. from, 
from your conference there, what are some, some of the standout moments of that event for you? Yeah, well, Simon, thanks for, for mentioning the conference. And um, any UK visitor to our conference will be treated like royalty. I was. Uh, given that... <laughs> and and we, we encourage all of your listeners to, to come and experience it. Uh, we'll be having our next one uh, in Sydney in September. But the, the last one we attended, and this is amazing, um, was in September 2019. So that's six months before the world completely changed. Yeah. And I remember the key themes at our conference there, the standout points where the industry is struggling. In Australia, profitability was less than 1%. It was. A third of all dealers were making no profit at all. We were at the height of the oversupply issue. Um, and I remember the notes in my speech at that convention um, was urging OEMs to prioritise profitability over volume. Um, and I'm pleased to say that uh, although, you know, none of us uh, think of the pandemic as, as a, you know, a good thing, um, there have been some benefits for the industry. Um, and, you know, it has seen dealers uh, being able to, to, to return to profitability, mostly because of the supply challenge. But I'm hoping that we all learn those lessons, that even if there are competitive manufacturers um, in the future that we don't go back to those dark days of 2019. So that's what that convention was at the time. Fast forward, we couldn't have a convention for, for the years 2020 or 21, but I'm glad to say we recently had one in June um, in Brisbane. Um, and it was a great mood. Uh, everyone was making money, but there were some lessons there, um, you know, lessons around um, not getting lazy, uh, uh, you know, trying to, uh, address some of the issues in your business so that when times do return to normal, um, we're, we're equipped to, uh, to run uh, profitable businesses. Um, but then there are other things. The world has changed in Australia around electrification. We've had a new government and um, we're going to be asked to do a lot more. So that was another theme of our conference. Um, and um, it'll be interesting to see where we are in a year's time, both with that supply issue and also where our government's going on electrification, because we're a little bit behind um, uh, markets like the UK and Europe and, and the US. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got some catching up to do. Yeah, I want to talk about um, EV later on, because um, yeah. um, when I was out there, I spoke to lots of dealers saying, ah, Australia's not set up for EV. But I remember thinking, well, I, I am Australian. I know I don't sound like it anymore, but I know that we live in cities mainly. Yes, it's a big old country, but how many people live in that urban combination? So um, it's not everyone is driving from uh, Perth to Adelaide all the time. That might be an issue, but um, I I'll talk about that in a second. But yep. I, I want to really get into agency now, okay? Yep. Uh, lots of manufacturers are introducing the agency model. Uh, I understand Honda, they're probably 12 months into the agency model in Australia. Uh, as I said right at the beginning of this, uh, something like 80% of Mercedes dealers are taking the manufacturer to court regarding the way agency was introduced. Um, now, clearly, there's lots of different types of agency, and I struggle to get my head around them. Can I ask you, overall, what's your view on the agency model? Yeah, look, it's very topical um, in Australia at the moment because of those brands that, that you mentioned, which, which are or have moved to an agency model. And one thing that the board has always made very clear to me, and I've been told by many of my members, um, and this is the AADA's attitude to agency, we are not opposed to the agency model. Mm -hmm. We believe that new retail models will always be considered and will emerge. And the OEM, frankly, you know, has a right to, to sort of try and, and experiment with new models or implement new models if they so wish. That's not in question. <clears throat> but what we are concerned about is the way in which these changes are made. And, and we are of the strong view that when you are going to make a fundamental change to the business model, remember, this is um, you've asked dealers to invest massive sums of capital into one model. And if you're going to just quickly switch to another model, you deserve to give those dealers plenty of notice. You should th thoroughly negotiate with them on the mechanics of the new model. I mean, uh, you know, you need to uh, sort of acknowledge that dealers have very specific expertise, often gained over a long period of time, and that you can only benefit from tapping into that expertise 
when you're developing a new model. So plenty of notice, um, negotiation with, with the experts and payment and compensation for goodwill that does get uh, uh, lost when, when these models change. Those are some of the principles we expect manufacturers to abide by. I think you will see some of the more ethically minded ones uh, sort of do so. And um, mm -hmm. there are examples um, I've heard of, of Toyota in New Zealand, for instance, in which they worked over a very long period of time with their dealers to move to an agency model. Um, but what we've seen, frankly, with Honda and, um, and Mercedes in this market is, uh, you know, probably not what I'd call uh, best practice. And uh, that's why, as you said, it's extraordinary that 80% of a network mm. gets together yep. and takes an OEM to court. You just don't hear of that. As you that know. is the figure. It, it is 80%. It's okay. around 80%, yeah. uh, I think, um, you know, give or take, but but that's that's the number. It's it's most of the sites um, uh, and, and uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not a great place to be. You don't want to be in court with the OEM. No one wants that. Mm. It's only when you reach uh, the conclusion that it's the only way to go. Uh, is that you do that and um, you know we'll see it's, it's going to be a very important case uh, for uh, dealers in Australia and I think even dealers in other parts of the world because a lot of people are watching this uh, everyone over here is they are so let's talk 12 months of Honda okay I heard some horror stories about um, Patrick Tessier a good friend of the podcast uh, a yeah. good friend of both of us um, told me some yeah. horror stories about how it was introduced in the Melbourne dealers there we're 12 months into it and um, when we first uh, spoke about some of the questions we're going to talk about James uh, that day I spoke to a um, a, a dealer who missed out on the agency model to a competitor and I spoke to him just when when we wrote these questions and he said uh, word for word thank fuck I didn't win that one the deal who actually got it would actually hand it back so uh, now I don't know if this is just one person what's your views from the dealer's point of view on how Honda has worked 12 months down the track um, yeah. what, what's lessons from the Honda okay so Honda, look, I think it's always important when you're looking at brands that go into agencies, where are they coming from? Mm -hmm. So Honda um, in Australia, you mentioned Mazda uh, earlier. Honda is not what it is in the UK. It was probably mm -hmm. a brand um, in the 2019, which was just hanging on to the top 10, selling about 40,000 units a year. And they didn't see that as, um, as the way to go. They, they, they felt they weren't making enough money. So the, their, their strategy was to move to an agency model, mm -hmm. but also to half the volume. So to go from a 40,000 unit a year brand to 20,000. Um, and in the process, they decided that they would uh, terminate or um, reduce their network in the metropolitan areas by 75%. So we had 12 dealers in Sydney, became three. I think wow. similar in, in, a, in a place like uh, Melbourne, in Brisbane, I think it went from four to one. So massive consolidation in the, in the uh, metros, no consolidation in the rural areas. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got this reduction in volume um, and because of their product mix, um, they really haven't appealed to rural buyers. So you've got a lot of these rural Honda agents who are now really selling very small amounts um, and there isn't much they can do in their business to, uh, to make a sale, to close a sale because most of the control is exercised by the OEM. Uh, so um, look, uh, on, on the Metro dealers, uh, you know, they, they, they're probably making it work. But remember, they've got a much bigger slice of the pie than they would mm. have had before the rationalisation. But yeah. I have heard the same message you heard from a lot of the regional dealers. Um, Honda um, Australia is, uh, you know, sort of on the record as saying this is exactly what they expected. Um, but, you know, I must say it's, it's, it's quite sad because there's some, some dealers who are still in court with Honda, there's some mm. of those terminated dealers. Um, and these are... These are relationships that existed for 40 plus years and the way it ends is in a, in a court. So, um, you know, again, it's, it's, it's difficult to do these things properly, but I think it's incumbent on OEMs uh, to do, do everything in their power uh, to at least ensure their dealers are, you know, somewhat satisfied when a relationship does end. And if there is a new relationship in which um, the, the economics is questionable, they need to, uh, I think, look at, 
at how they support those dealers too, who might be thinking of giving back the franchise. Mm. Well, going forward with agency, of course, there's lots of different agency models. And there's genuine agency. I think if this is the right terminology, non-genuine agency, yeah. it's so confusing. Someone, <laughs> someone listening, have I got that terminology right? Genuine, yeah. non-genuine? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm not the expert because the, the, the whole debate around genuine and non-genuine, I think, is more of a European uh, mm. and, and the UK. But as I understand it, you have a, a non-genuine agency, which is an agency model in which the price is basically fixed, but there's a bit of wiggle room for the agent um, and the agent still takes on risks. Whereas what EU law says is if you want to qualify as a genuine agent and escape all of the uh, confines of competition law, the agent can take on no risk whatsoever. Um, and, and that's something I'm really interested in and something I want to learn about when I come to, yeah. to Europe next month. Um, as far as Australia's concerned, is I understand we've only got uh, genuine agency models. Um, but I want to test that because I want to test this issue of risk. What is risk? Yes. Is, uh, is a, is a long-term lease a risk? Yep. Is, a, um, is, is a sunk investment uh, that, that you've had this massive uh, showroom that you built uh, three years ago, is that considered risk? So, you know, I think as an industry, we're still educating regulators uh, on, on what agency means. And I think they're still getting their head around what they think it means. So, yeah, it's, it's, I think we're at an early phase and we're still nutting out some of the terminology around genuine and, and non-genuine. Um, but from an Australian perspective, I think, you know, the, the, the concepts are that an agency model is a fixed price system where the, uh, the, the stock is owned by the OEM, um, the marketing activities are undertaken by the OEM, um, and the agent is merely there to facilitate a transaction. We had, um, again, on the podcast, people interested in agency have probably listened to the, the episode with Mike Jones, uh, formerly of ASE over here. And um, I think it was Mike who was saying about, um, hold on, yes, we're agency, but you still got to let the, cons the customer know that you can have a bit of wiggle room. So is yeah. it agency? Is it not? Um, get, can the manufacturer do pure agency? Because my understanding, if there's no risk, they, they have to take on all the freehold. It's it's a bit of a minefield, isn't it? And I, yeah. I want to ask about the consumer law because this yeah. is, it goes against consumer law. Surely That's it's... A, yeah. it, that is a great question. Uh, you, know, you know, some people sort of say, you know, how can agency be allowed because it's, you know, it allows the OEMs to set a price. Is that good for competition? But on the consumer law issues you talk about, and I don't know if this is the same in the UK, but in Australia the dealer and the manufacturer are jointly responsible for consumer mm -hmm. law. So if you have a dud car and you take it back to the dealer, because of that joint responsibility under competition law, the dealer has to sort of honour, uh, you know, has to take it back, repair it or in the worst case, provide a refund or a replacement and is then indemnified by the manufacturer. Now with the agency model, uh, it's very unclear what that status is under competition law. So a consumer will bring the car back the agent's like, well, I didn't sell this to you. I just facilitated the transaction. Um, and now you better go talk to the OEM. And again, it's the customer who doesn't have a good experience. And it's the dealer who's the one delivering the bad news and has to wear the bad experience. So I think that's a messy element of, of, uh, of the agency model that we will probably only come to terms with um, in a few years' time here in Australia. Mm, it's definitely going to be interesting there. Um, how that all plays out. It's um, um, tough. So listen, let's talk about Mercedes-Benz. Uh, I know there's some things you can't say at the moment. It's right in the middle of it. Uh, last time we spoke, you were you were listening in um, to what was happening there. And um, I think you're probably halfway through the court case at the moment. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, we, we, we uh, finish early uh, September and then they're closing arguments in October. So they, they, they're more than halfway, I'd say, yeah. Okay. And the argument from the manufacturers from what I hear is we're just doing this to look after the customer. We want transparency from the customer. Um, and I believe they're getting the, the customer on side saying, well, why wouldn't you want transparency? Um, how is it playing out in the court case? I know there's some things you probably can't uh, share with us, but can you tell us about how is it playing out currently? 
Yeah, so look, I'll tell you, the, the main claim from the dealers um, is that, um, you know, and again, some of this will be legalistic speak, but there's essentially a claim that Mercedes-Benz has um, taken parts of their business and appropriated parts of their business. And as a result, the dealers believe uh, there is a compensation claim for the lost goodwill to be paid. Now, this is something that's never really been tested properly in franchising law in Australia. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll see how that goes. But there's also an argument of unconscionable conduct. And that goes to the way in which this model was introduced. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the lack of due um, uh, of good faith in, in moving the dealers to this model and negotiating with them, but also a claim of economic duress. And that, that goes to, as you'd know, massive investments that were made. Mm. Uh, Mercedes-Benz sold a number of dealerships only a few years ago um, for, for pretty big multiples. Um, so, so that's been aired uh, as part of the court case. Mm. Uh, so an economic duress, unconscionable conduct and, um, and, and uh, you know, a breach of the good faith obligations. So uh, look, that's, that's what has been argued on, on legal grounds. Um, and, you know, essentially, uh, you know, we, we'll, we'll have to, wait for the judgment and then you know as, as an association you know we'll either have to hopefully um get a good outcome or you know if it doesn't go the dealer's way we're going to have to um seriously talk to the government about right sizing these laws because it just doesn't seem fair and equitable um for for a brand uh, to insist on significant investment uh to uh to have these long relationships in which one side has poured time, effort, mm. capital, blood, sweat and tears into a brand um, and then a change can just be made uh, which uh, erodes all of that goodwill. Uh, so, Jane, so, yeah. did, did, did I hear this right? So Mercedes has actually sold one of their Mercedes owns businesses for a significant multiple two or three years down the track, then they're saying, oh, by the way, we're going to change the terms. Surely the impact on that, um, was it Deloitte wrote a report saying that it could reduce the profits of the, the retailer by 50%? Uh, yeah. Is that right? Look, the, some of the examples we have seen with the, with a number of these models in Australia now is that the margins being offered are basically half okay. um, of, of what they were before. And look, there are reductions in some expenses, um, uh, floor plan, finance, um, some of the, the roles that the manufacturer has taken over, such as, um, uh, you know, marketing and so forth. Um, but, you know, the thing about agency, Simon, is it takes the ability to control your business away. Uh, you, you cannot make some of the key decisions which are appropriate to your circumstances. Mm -hmm. If the OEMs are unable, and I'm just saying, if the OEMs are unable to execute some of those functions in our control, such as the ordering of stock, such as pricing policy, um, if they don't execute well, <coughs> that could affect volume. And then you're losing profit, not only in your new car side of things, but the associated revenue streams that go along with new car sales, finance, insurance, uh, repeat service customers. So, so I think the biggest concern there is, is do we necessarily trust a manufacturer to conduct retail operations? They've tried in the past. We know they have. And more often than not, they haven't been very good at it. And that's okay. Dealers aren't very good at making cars. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I had um, one person who, who, to be fair, didn't want this recorded. And I understand why. But he said, the way I look at it, agencies kind of just like communism. Now, I, that might be a bit harsh, okay? But I suppose where's the entrepreneurial spirit if you can't look at pricing and that's it? Um, and the other bit I struggle to get my head around is when the manufacturer hits the panic button, and they have a whole lot of stock they need to get rid of because they've built them wrong. I, um, what's going to happen there? Um, I, I don't know what's going to happen with that one. It's a, it's a crystal ball yeah. side of it there. Um, yeah, but also, communism, though. I think communism is not a bad way. And I've heard of similar, similar, people, or similar statements made in Australia. I mean, the ability to differentiate is significantly diminished. Agents do not get involved in, in marketing in stock handling, in price setting, they merely facilitate the sale. And in its purest form, the agency will see the OEM increasingly try and influence processes and the overall customer experience. And processes will be driven from above. 
that they're basically trying to replicate the Apple Store experience. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you'll have an identical experience no matter where you are. Um, and the end game after that, Simon, is a move uh, is to move a large proportion of retail sales online. That just leads me to say that all details of this episode and other episodes on the selling in the motor trade can be found on our website, simcotraining.co.uk. Go there to get a copy of our book, Words That Sell Cars. Go there to sign up to a free trial of our sales fitness online sales training program. Easiest way to get hold of me is Simon Bokert through LinkedIn. Thank you.